Hello and welcome to the Social Thread podcast. Social Thread is a nonprofit where you can belong, you can thrive, and you can explore your faith on your own terms and community. And uh, as always, I am Robert Payne, and I'm the Community Development Director. And with me today is Rob Reinders, the founder of Social Thread. Awesome. And then we have an amazing guest today, John Deanna, 27-year veteran, a senior reporter of the storytelling crew at the Arizona Republic. John, thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Rob, fire away, brother. Yeah. So, uh, John, you, you are a, uh, an avid participant in our Tuesday night uh, meetups. Where, where we share a lot of secret, secret stuff. A lot of really secret things uh, go on there. But uh, <laughs> I, we, we think you have a, an interesting story to tell. And then also um, uh, the nature of, of your job, I think aligns with some of what we, we believe um, here at the core of social thread around um, getting to know our neighbors and practicing empathy and telling stories and, and all that stuff. Um, so that's why why we brought you on the show today, and um, you have a, an interesting, um, you know, faith, faith journey of you know where where you started, of where you've been, and, and where where you may or may not be going, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so that we just start out like maybe maybe share about that. Um, what's that journey been like for you? Uh, well, I was raised Roman Catholic, and it was. Um, you know, my, uh, my father was the son of Italian immigrants. So, um, it was very, uh, doctrine based. Um, you know, you went, you did the, uh, the first communion, the first confession, all that kind of stuff. Um, but while I, I sort of appreciated the, the, the ritual aspect and the comfort and ritual aspect, um, you know, it, it just never really answered questions, um, for me, like, uh, you know, what am I doing here in the first place? And um, when my dad was in the, he was in the military, a career military officer, and we went to, we um, were stationed in Japan. And there I was exposed to a lot of uh, Eastern religions in Buddhism, etc. And um, I started to sort of explore. And as I, the more I explored, the, the more I, I drifted away from uh, the Catholic church. And, uh, you know, as a young adult in college, um, I just found less and less need for, um, you know, any kind of religious anchor. And when I met my wife, <clears throat> we uh, fell in love. We met actually at the University of Arizona. She was shooting a football game and I was watching the football game and checking out the, uh, the blonde photographer on the sidelines. And uh, we were uh, just by chance happened to meet at the end of the game and I asked her out and she stood me up and then I asked her out again and uh, the rest is history. But uh, she was raised Southern Baptist. I was raised Catholic and, you know, we kind of knew that religion was going to be part of our our, our life. Um, and, uh, so we sort of met in the middle at, uh, at United Methodist. And, uh, so, uh, got married. We were, uh, have been longtime members of a United Methodist church here. And one of the things that really appealed to me about the church, it's an urban church in, uh, in Tempe was the sort of the social justice mis- mission. And um, we did a lot for um, uh, the homeless. Uh, there was a shower program, things like that, that I volunteered for. Um, in uh, the early 2000s, uh, after 9-11, uh, and particularly when the U.S. entered the war in Iraq, um, I had a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, anger about that, quite frankly. And it just, uh, as, as a journalist, one of the, the big ironies is you don't really have any First Amendment rights. So you can't state your political opinion and you can't go out and march and you can't put signs in your yard or bumper stickers on your car. 
Some journalists do, but, um, but I don't. And most of the people I work with don't. Um, and we try to remain on the surface as apolitical as, apolitical as, as, as possible. And, uh, but the war to me just seemed so wrong, uh, particularly the war in Iraq. And so, um, you know, I, I wrestled with it for a long time and decided that, well, if I can't go out and march to peace, maybe there's a way I can bring peace to people one person at a time. And uh, I joined the Stephen ministry at our church. And that's a one-on-one -on -one crisis, um, crisis care ministry. And we're, we received uh, a lot of training. I think it was like 300 hours of training before we were um, able to, uh, to help with people. But along the way, um, you know, in my, my journalistic journey, I, I had experiences that were um, where I was covering people of faith. Uh, one of those was I covered the uh, sanctuary movement in the 19, mid 1980s here. And that was after uh, uh, the Reagan administration had infiltrated churches trying to find um, people who were um, harboring illegal immigrants. And um, I, I went along on an underground railroad caravan, uh, ferrying immigrants from El Salvador and Guatemala and covered that. And it was, uh, I think we were on the road for about three weeks. And I developed a close relationship with a, a doctor who was on the trip and he was an, an elderly African-American gentleman and his, um, his outlook was really incredible and his Christian outlook was really incredible. And that, that was a, a real model for me. And so I've run across people like that um, all my life who've been inspirational for me. And so uh, that, that's sort of been my journey and how I've tied things together. Talk about how um, you, you said you were sort of in this exploring phase in college uh, and exploring Eastern, um, you know, religions kind of as a late teenager and, um, and, and stuff like that. How did that exploration of faith and spirituality kind of intersect with your, your calling or decision to, to study and go into journalism? Um, not as much as you might think. Uh, my decision to go into journalism was, um, you know, there were, there, were, there were two big factors that are two big incidents that occurred. The first was uh, um, the Watergate era. Uh, I was uh, about 14 years old when the Watergate story happened. And, you know, just knowing that two reporters could do something that was powerful enough to bring down the president of the United States, that, that sort of, um, you know, planted in my mind the idea that uh, reporters do important work. And then the second thing that happened was the assassination of Don Bowles uh, up here in Phoenix. And it's, you know, it, it, it's amazing. I, I, I now work, uh, you know, at the same place that he did back then. And so that happened when I was 16, and I read every day in the um, in the Tucson Citizen, the late late great Tucson Citizen, um, you know how the doctors were amputating one limb at a time, trying to keep him alive. Um, the explosion happened on uh, June 2nd of 1976, and he died 11 days later in just seething agony. And so that you know to think that he was doing work that was so important that somebody uh, went to those kinds of efforts to silence him. Um, that also made me think uh, that journalism was really important work. And, you know, another thing that, that kind of was um, in my mind was this notion of, uh, of giving voice to the voiceless. Uh, and journalism is, is definitely a great way to do that. Um, when, uh, uh, when I was in college, there was a really small paper in Northern California called the Point Reyes Light. And there was a, um, uh, I guess it was a cult uh, church called Synanon. And the Point Reyes Light, it was basically just run by a husband and wife. 
and they investigated this Synanon group and actually won a Pulitzer Prize. And so, um, you know, for all of the people who had been pulled into that cult, the, uh, you know, the, this husband and wife journalism team basically gave their relatives a voice and, you know, helped, them, helped end that, um, you know, that situation. That's really cool. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, talk, talk about the work you're doing the, the last couple of years. You, you were, you know, more of in a management kind of editorial role, but um, now you're back, I guess, pounding the pavement. If, is that a <laughs> appropriate or, or uh, uh, driving yeah. the, driving the Arizona freeways? Yeah, uh, anyway, definitely. Definitely. Talk, talking to people, um, hearing stories like what, what draws you, you to that, to, to go out and, and to, to hear those stories. Well, early on in my career, uh, as a reporter, I was, I always gravitated to, again, those kinds of stories that give voice to the voiceless. I did a lot of stories on homelessness and things like that. Um, and then, uh, I spent a long time longer than I care to remember in management. And, you know, I was kind of on the executive track and then, you know, we had buyouts and take corporate takeovers and all that kind of thing. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, I had a, I had a passion project. Uh, it was a story that I'd worked on for nearly 30 years. And um, I, I broke the first story when a woman who was known as the hat box baby um, resurfaced after nobody hearing from her for 55 years. And she was the subject of a really old Arizona mystery. Um, in 1931, uh, a baby was left by the side of the road and discovered out in the middle of the desert uh, along a desert highway in the middle of nowhere. And she was discovered and taken to town. Um, she was stuffed into a hat box and she was, she was still alive and then put up for adoption, never heard from again. And so um, trying to help her solve the mystery of who put her, left her out in the desert to die essentially and why um, uh, was just something that I had uh, pursued on and off, even all during all those years in management. And I'd written stories hoping that, you know, would, would find a clue. Uh, and, uh, Toward the end of her life, uh, several years ago, um, you know, I, I sort of convinced her to take one last shot and do some DNA testing. And really, really long story short, I mean, 10 part series long story, um, we, we were able to find out who her birth parents were and solve that mystery for her. And so uh, at the time, I had told uh, we had a new top editor at the Republic, a guy named Greg Burton, a great guy. And I was telling him about that. And he said, man, that's a great story. You know, how would you like to do that? You know, become a reporter on the storytelling team and flesh that story out and finish it and do all that. So uh, it sounded like a great idea. I was ready for a change. And so I jumped in. And ever since I've been doing a lot of different kinds of stories, and I've been sort of uh, gravitating to stories on race and social justice. Um, one of the, you know, uh, one of the first stories I did out of the gate was on an old cemetery in South Phoenix. And it had completely, uh, over the last 50 years or so, it's completely fallen into ruin. It's not even identifiable as a cemetery, but there's still over 300 souls buried there. And there's no dignity or whatsoever for them. And these souls were not important people in the sense that, uh, you know, they were civic leaders or anything, but they were the people, mostly uh, Mexican immigrants or uh, Mexican nationals who, um, who were very important in the building of Phoenix because they were the ones who, who helped build it. And so, um, uh, I, I did a story about this, you know, sort of highlighting this, this sense of injustice. And um, there's a young man who uh, sort of envisions himself as the, uh, or considers himself to be the, the caretaker of this place. And he chases vandals off. And when illegal dumpers uh, try to dump stuff there, he, 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 you know, calls the police on them. 
And so, you know, he was just kind of like, you know, giving a voice to the dead and a voice to the, to the voiceless. And so that, that really appealed to me. Um, I've, I also wind up doing a lot of stories um, on race. Um, there was a young man in, in Phoenix who saw a, uh, a photograph in a restaurant and it appeared to him uh, to be men in blackface. And he um, raised a question about it. He's African-American. He, he raised a question about it with the management. And it just was not a very satisfactory exchange. He felt that he was dismissed. Um, he later wrote an op-ed about it for the uh, Arizona Republic. And um, the backlash he got was horrendous. Uh, he got over 800 mostly vile racist emails, um, uh, you know, some of, the, some of which were actually threatening. And so I did a story about that and, you know, sort of helped kind of put this whole thing into context. And, um, you know, it was a story that I felt was important to do. And there were other people at the paper who's, you know, on whose beats that story really was. Um, but nobody was really willing to, to, to take it on. And um, because I guess it has so many layers of complexity to it. And that's another thing that attracts me to that kind of story. And then um, uh, earlier this year, I published a, uh, a four-part series on a young man who was involved in the notorious Hamilton High School football hazing scandal. And that was a big scandal that uh, was all over the, the news three, three or four years ago. And after all that time, there were six kids arrested and charged with some really just vile and reprehensible uh, conduct. But um, of the six kids arrested, uh, three were, the charges against three of them were immediately dismissed. Um, two others took plea deals in juvenile court and went on to play college football, uh, graduate high school and play college football. And yet this one young man was the only one who was being tried as an adult. And he, even though he was African American, he wasn't, I, I didn't feel in my investigation, I did a very uh, uh, a long, it took me almost uh, six months to investigate his case. Um, I, I don't believe he was being prosecuted because of his race, but more because he was an outsider. He did not fit in at the school. Um, the school has a lot of kids uh, with very wealthy parents and he was not one of them. So he didn't fit in that way. Um, he didn't fit in um, because he also attended um, a charter school for credit recovery and only took two classes at Hamilton. So he was an outsider in that regard. And he was also an outsider even on the football team because, you know, he just frankly wasn't very good at football. And so um, he was the most easily sacrificed kid. And so um, you had a county attorney at the time who's now on the Arizona Supreme Court who really wanted a, you know, he, he, he made several public uh, pleas for witnesses to come forward and help him in this case. And, um, you know, I think they really thought that they had another type of uh, Penn State situation there. And it really wasn't that at all. And so I did a, story, a series of stories exploring that. And, you know, we went into the, um, the school to prison pipeline and to uh, the responsibility of the adults. There were three adults who the police recommended charging, but the county attorney never, uh, never charged uh, any of the three of them. So um, here you had this one kid hanging out there um, and his life was literally put on hold. He never graduated from high school. Um, you know, all the other kids who were involved went on to live their lives. And uh, you know, this one young man was, was stuck. Um, and after, after our series ran, um, he was able to negotiate a, uh, a, a much more favorable plea deal. So I was really proud of, proud, proud of that. So when you're, you you don't you don't pick easy things to report on, <laughs> and uh, and it, it sounds like there's probably not a lot of there's probably a lot of people who aren't happy when you're investigating these stories coming around asking questions. Um, but but you have to get the story. You have to hear from 
these different perspectives, um, talk to people who may not want to be talked to, um, and talk to people you may not want to talk to. Um, (laughs) how do you, yeah. How do you approach, um, those relationships, asking those questions, um, and, and listening and then crafting all of those narratives, um, in, into a story and what, what can maybe we learn in our, in our day-to-day lives, um, from that and the conversations and the relationships we have with other people. Well, I guess the first thing is, um, you know, if you want to give voice to the voiceless, sometimes you have to listen to voices you don't really want to listen to. Um, and so I've been working on a story lately uh, about a series of uh, racist incidents up in uh, the town of Prescott. And the, you know, it's, it's very, the racism is very out in the open up there. And so the other day I was driving by uh, I'm driving down the street and I see an apartment building sort of set back off of a, of a road. And from the balcony of this apartment, I see a Blue Lives Matter flag, an American flag, and then a Confederate flag next to it. Uh, well, maybe I'll just go talk to the guy. And so um, I had been dealing with uh, people. There, there was a, a rally on the the town square there uh, after the Black Lives Matter protests started. And there were, you know, several hundred people uh, out there uh, chanting Black Lives Matter. Most, almost all of them were white. And, um, you know, kind of an American moment uh, protest and singing This Little Light of Mine and then completely surrounding them on uh, on Whiskey Row in, in, in Prescott were uh, people wearing black t-shirts and blue jeans armed with, uh, uh, you know, assault style weapons and sidearms. And uh, I've got a picture of one that was even holding an ax handle. So you got this very sort of threatening group around them. And uh, so in knocking on this guy's door with the, uh, the Confederate flag, I didn't know if I was gonna be confronted by somebody with an AK, somebody who was hostile to the media, um, you know, so I was kind of prepared for anything and, uh, my, my, you know, my heart was in my throat a little bit. Um, and this guy opened the door and, uh, not at all what I expected. He was, uh, an older guy and he just seemed kind of beaten down by life. Um, you know, he's been hit hard, but he's a blue collar worker has been hit hard by COVID, um, uh, I mean, his work has dried up because of, of COVID. He's struggling economically. And I asked him about the flag and he says, you know, uh, he's a big NASCAR fan. I said, well, NASCAR banned the, the, the flag. And he said, yeah, well, you know, that, that's just them. And uh, I said, well, and, and he proceeds to tell me, and it's something you hear a lot. It's like, oh, I've got, you know, I grew up with black people. I grew up, I grew up with black friends and I, had, I still have black friends. And I said, well, you know, what have any of them said about the flag? He says, well, I haven't asked him about it. I said, well, have they seen it? He says, I don't know. I don't think so. I said, well, what do you think they would would say about it? I don't know. But if they want to hold, uh, have a Black Lives Matter flag on their balcony, that's fine with me. We have a First Amendment. So, um, you know, we had that conversation and, you know, he was not a seething, uh, you know, uh, you know, virulent type of racist. I, I don't know what, what's truly in his heart. I just had to take him what he, at his word what he said. And then uh, the next day I was talking to uh, another activist on the phone up in Prescott and he said, and I told him that I'd gone to that house and knocked on the door and he said, that flag is gone. So after our conversation, the guy took the flag down. So I don't know if he talked to his black friends and asked them, you know, what they thought or what, or whether it was just, you know, the thought of and he gave me his name and, you know, the thought of his name appearing in the paper, you know, with somebody uh, having a, a flag like that. Um, you know, so you meet people like that. And he's a guy who, uh, you know, even though I, I, I disagree with his, his beliefs and assessment, you know, I, I feel he has a right to have his voice heard. Um, there's other people whose beliefs are much more abhorrent. Um, I, I've interviewed a bunch of members of some... Uh, extreme, I mean, groups that the FBI 
lists as uh, you know domestic uh, a, 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 as members of groups that promote domestic terror, and those people are a lot scarier. And um, you know, it's uh, um, uh, you have to really worry about you know, do you amplify their voice? Um, and and in many cases, those voices run counter to everything we believe in as as a country um, or everything I believe in and uh, do you risk amplifying those voices and giving them credibility and legitimacy and that's a tough question and it's one we we worry about all the time um, but at some point you do need to explain it and you do need to and and I've always come down on the side that if you give people the information they can make an intelligent decision and so, um, you know, hopefully if I can put, you know, that their words into context that people will be able to make an intelligent decision about it. Yeah. I, I you know, I really appreciate, uh, what, what, what you're saying, John, and, um, you know, how we can learn to, um, how we can learn to listen to people, uh, who we don't agree with, which, you know, for all of us is, I, I think is very, very difficult to um to not throw stones but to sit and listen and give voice to the voiceless even though we may not agree with it um yeah i think that's i think it's amazing uh, yeah. well it's um you know the, the cool thing about this career is that every day is an adventure um someday the adventure involves uh you know having IT uh, make sure your computer works <laughs> and you know you can spend hours going down that rabbit hole. Uh, and luckily we have a great IT department that takes care of us. But you know, other days the, you know, the adventure is you're driving by and you see something um, and you stop and ask questions about it. And, uh, um, you know, and it leads you to things that you never thought you'd, uh, you'd learn. Uh, going back to the hat box baby, um, you know, we had traced the birth parents to Iowa. So I went to Iowa to um, do some research and see what I could find. And uh, one night I'm driving home from, or driving back to my hotel from an interview. And I drive past a street called High Street. And I remembered that in some of my research um, of the city directories where these parents had lived, that they had a house on High Street. So I thought, well, I'll just drive by the house. So I find the address where the house was. And um, it's like eight o'clock at night. It's in December. It's snowy. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought, well, okay, I've seen the house. Great. And then the voice of every old city editor that I'd ever had said, go knock on the door, you know, because there were many times when I came back to the newsroom and the city editor said, did you knock on the door? I'm like, no. And he goes, go back out there and knock on the door. So, uh, so I knocked on the door and I said, uh, you know, uh, hi, I'm doing some, uh, I, I didn't lead with the fact that I was a reporter because you never know how people are gonna react to that these days. And uh, the, uh, I knocked on the door and said, I'm doing some genealogical research um, and I'm trying to find information about, um, uh, you know, Walter and Frida Roth. Um, do you know anything about them? They used to live in this house. She goes, no, I'm, they're my relatives. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> And I said, well, the reason I'm doing this genealogical research is for a newspaper story. And, and then I, you know, explained the whole thing. And so and she says, the Hatbox Baby, I know the Hatbox Baby's story. I saw it on Unsolved Mysteries. And uh, so she was a big fan of um, the Hatbox Baby story. And so it just led to, you know, all these, these different avenues. And so, you know, if I hadn't happened to see that street and hadn't, you know, uh, gone up and knocked on the door, I, I would have never gotten all this information about uh, Walter and Frieda Roth. So uh, just got to be curious. That's kind of a, a cool metaphor for, um, I guess if we want to bring it full circle back to the, the faith thing, um, is a lot of times we get curious about those big questions. And, um, you know, I guess we encourage uh, with social thread. And I think it's a big reason we started this was, um, 
we encourage people go knock on the door. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Questions definitely. pop up, something, something's going on I- inside. Um, and, uh, you know, we may want to want to run away from it or not explore it, but, you know, we would advocate for knock on the door, go, go deeper, ask, ask the questions. And, and we hope, we hope we're a place to, um, to do that. Um, but also well, there's a lot of folks out there like yourself. Um, you, you love asking those questions. Definitely. And one, you know, one of the things about social thread is, um, it's kind of the same thing that I think makes for better journalism. And in social thread, uh, we talk about things that, um, you know, and we, we sort of uh, turn them over and look at them from different angles and bring this variety of um, perspectives, um, you know, to, to look at a particular subject or, 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 or topic. And, you know, as a journalist, that's important to do as well. Um, you know, it, you can go to a meeting and write a story about the meeting and, you know, not have any, um, uh, you know, problems with it. And, and a lot of journalists are really comfortable going and doing coverage of events. But um, if you elevate that, and make your coverage about ideas instead of events, um, then you have to look at things differently. You have to pick up the rock and turn it over and look at it. And maybe it's not a rock, maybe it's a fossil, or maybe it's a petrified piece of cow dung, who knows? But, um, you know, it can be a lot of different things. And so, um, yeah, that's one of the things I love about Social Thread is we, you know, we turn these things over and we look at them from all kinds of different, different angles and uh, there's no right or wrong answers. And that's, that's another cool thing. So there's, there's not any, um, any real judgment. And sometimes uh, in journalism, when you're turning over those rocks, um, there's no right or wrong answers. Um, but hopefully if you can uh, weave a, uh, a narrative together about them, then you can uh, give people something to think about. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for being here and sharing your insights. Um, If you're listening to this podcast and you are uh, wondering, hey, how can I get involved in something like Social Thread? Well, you can go to the website, uh, socialthread.org and click get involved. And um, right away, you can get involved in exploring your faith on your own terms, um, you know, learning the skills of having a conversation of, of and listening to people who may have different and opposing views than you do, and, um, and really being able to do that in community. And uh, that is uh, the essence of social thread. And um, uh, if you want to get involved in another way, you can, of course, uh, make a donation. We're a nonprofit. So you can go to um, socialthread.org forward slash support and get involved that way. Well, hey, thank you guys so much, John, again, thank you. Um, it's been amazing talking to you. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thanks, Robert. All right. We'll see you next time.